So this next activity, again, we got we have a lot of lead-ins, don't we? We do. <laughs> Well, the activities tie to something that we want them to reflect on. So yeah, so, yeah. So th- th- this is uh, we talk about this as the illusion of knowledge, right? And the illusion of knowledge simply it manifests itself in a number of different ways. Right? So one is that people think they know more than they actually do, mm-hmm. which is referred to as the Dunning and Kruger effect, right? So incompetent people aren't. Are in, they can't recognize their incompetence, so they actually think they're more competent than they do. Mm-hmm. The the shadow side or the flip side of the Dunning and Kruger effect is the imposter syndrome mm-hmm. that people typically think that um, I must because everyone else isn't getting this, I must not be as smart as I think that I am, right? And so th- those are illusions of knowledge, and so we we invite people to kind of challenge the, their own illusions of knowledge. And uh, one way is by looking at the bus and, and deciding which way the bus is going. Typically, um, young people under the age of seven get this correct all the time. Mm. You know, and did you see why they did that? Did you see that in the video? No, I didn't. Okay, so, so there's a video that, that uh, we'll make available to you that you can use if you have time. But... Um, most young people say that the bus is lo- moving to the left um, because they ride they ride the school bus and mm-hmm. that's where the door is mm-hmm. right on the other side and nice. so those of us who don't ride the bu- the bus very often mm-hmm. would not necessarily recognize which direction that goes right so we mm-hmm. assume we know things and when in fact we don't which is how we get to the bicycle exercise right and with the bicycle exercise we ask people to you know how many of you have ridden a bicycle look know what a bicycle looks like and so please take a minute to sketch that out in that section and that once they do we ask them to look at it and see what they think is missing look at one another's bicycle and see what they think is missing and often you'd find people forget to put handlebars or pedals or even a seat yeah um and so it's it's interesting to think oh i know how to ride a bicycle i know what a bicycle looks like but when it actually comes down to it do i know how to draw that out and what it requires to run the proper bicycle yeah and you have an awesome video on this too if you want to use that around a company that did this exercise and then built the bicycles the way they were sketched and had the person who did the drawing try to ride the bicycle and only one person actually got that right. So it was a really fun video to watch too. Yeah, so we'll make sure that that's attached to this as an ancillary or additional piece, particularly if you're doing a longer session, right? Um, But the, the real takeaway about this is that we have to challenge our assumptions, right? Our illusion of knowledge. And so that's where the unconscious bias and stereotype threat pieces come in. And when we start talking about uh, the three stories, so there's William, there's Jane, and there is Katie. And each of their stories have some nuances around this, either the approach that people have had making this uh, th- this acknowledgement of the illusion of knowledge mm-hmm. or addressing this unconscious bias. And so um, we'd like to use this activity to really start talking about how do we challenge and address our unconscious bias. So when you walk into any situation and you assume you know stuff, uh, you might not actually know it. And that's where these exercises come in to say, I think I know it, but this is how I'm going to ask questions instead of making assumptions. Yeah. So in William's case, uh, and you saw this in the, um, in the lesson, in William's case, he uh, really feels as though he's being questioned um, for not just who, what he's done or who he is, but because he is a part of an ethnic or, or, or racial group. Mm-hmm. And so we also take people through an activity that challenges their illusion of knowledge or what they've learned uh, with those pluses, minuses, and zeros. So this activity is very similar to the activity that we did previously about pluses, minuses, and zeros. And so this could be something that people take home with them or that they that you address very, very briefly. But the, the nuance in this particular uh, exercise that is a bit different is that we've added obesity mm-hmm. um, to that. And unfortunately... For, for, for many folks, that is still the one of the prejudices or uh, 
or, or ways to discriminate people that are socially acceptable. Right. right. Uh, we've also added women in leadership and then people like yourself because you may I have identities that you feel are um, being dealt with differently. Yep. So that would be very similar to the pluses, minuses, and zeros. All right. Uh, in my exercises, I found that once we've gotten through that first one, we typically do this as homework just for the for time. Yep. So next, we we talk about um, Jane, and and in Jane's case. Jane is, uh, as you remember, being challenged to, to speak up for herself and be an advocate for herself and also looking at that pushback that, or the fear of the pushback mm -hmm. by being an outspoken woman, right? Um, and so this activity really is um, about looking at the double standards. And how have you used this activity in, in your sessions? So... We ask people to look at the words in the center and then define them, put it into the respective boxes, right? Typically, if you see aggressive, and you could have this on both sides, but if you see aggressive for men and boys and you think of, you know, football and aggression is a positive um, word in that context, but then when you see aggressive for women, it becomes a negative connotation to that word. And so we've asked them to define it and see where that works and how how that is perceived to everyone who hears that in the context of a man or a woman. Yeah, and the the the, the secret to this activity, and only you as a facilitator will 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 you you're no smarter than anybody else, so somebody else will probably <laughs> figure it out too. But the uh, the the words are paired, and they're paired in such a way that the activity uh, that is happening. Uh, can have one of those two descriptors. And so when we talk about ag ag aggressive versus um, assertive. Uh, assertive, right? Yeah. So those are actually the same activity, but the descriptors make them sound very different. Mm -hmm. And so um, as you think about those, what we know is that all of those words can be applied to men and, and boys as equally as they can to women and girls. Um, however, our societal norms mm -hmm. have set them up in, in, into this double standard. And so the conversation really is about how valid are the double standards that we have for, for men, and, men and boys and women and girls. And so having the, that conversation. And what about those people who don't fall within that gender binary that are non-gender conforming? How do these these words come up? And so this this notion of a double standard um, can oftentimes hold us back. And so that that the conversation really is about um, the validity of of this double standard. And then what that does to people in the workplace, right? Where women. Um, do, are you getting the best out of everyone because you're using words that defines these people um, and has a negative or positive connotation based on our culture? Yeah. Some of the projects we're working on right now are around job descriptions mm -hmm. and, uh, and job postings, making sure that they don't have gendered language right. because that gets us the kinds of candidates that these words uh, uh in gender, identify right? with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so there's that with with uh, Jane's story. And the next activity you'll see that we talk about words. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. This one. Okay. About words mattering uh, and mental models. So yeah. the exercise we do here is to have people close their eyes for a, a moment and say, "Picture an apple." And then when they open their eyes, we ask them to define what they saw as an apple in one word. Like, is it, you know, a fresh apple, a red apple, um, apple for health or whatever it is positively. And then we challenge them to close their eyes again. And then we just add the word rotten and say, OK, now picture a rotten apple and have them tell us what they pictured. Yeah. And this activity takes about... For, uh, no, no more than a minute and a half or yeah, so. Yeah, a minute and a half or so. Um, but again, the reflection on the activity is, is the key point. And so uh, we know that words matter, that the words that we speak actually transmit mm -hmm. my idea to you mm -hmm. and vice versa. And the more that we can be articulate about the words that we use, mm -hmm. um, the more specific 
the, the picture or more accurately, mm -hmm. my idea gets transferred to another person. And so when we use, you know, um, and, and, and people, this is where people want to talk about, you know, is this politically correct or I don't want to be politically correct. Um, and, I, and I don't want to get, I don't want you to get into that conversation. What I do want us to, to really think about is how are we being effective in our communication? And so if uh, political correctness is a blockage to that effectiveness, mm -hmm. then we certainly don't want to do that. But if I can't talk civilly to another individual, mm -hmm. that becomes ineffective. So, so trying to find something that, that really changes uh, how we talk so that we can be effective. Um, and then what we what we challenge and what we don't challenge matters, right? So those those previous zeros, those things that we don't address, we fill in the gaps on those mm -hmm. things, yeah. right? And so our silence is uh, is acceptance. And so if people are using inappropriate terms mm -hmm. or words or slang terms that aren't uplifting. Uh, or motivating to, to people, then those are the mental models and the things that we should be challenging. And now we have Kate. And, and Kate, Kate's um, story is a very interesting one because it is really about an attribution mm -hmm. error, right? right? So we're attributing... Um, we're trying to make a cause and effect analysis when there is no connection between the cause and the effect. Because we're trying to justify our bias there. Yeah. So in Kate's situation, she is uh, perceived to be obese by a uh, by a physician. But what we also recognize is that um, BMI, body mass index, is not directly related to health, right? Like health and body mass index, uh, there may be some correlations, but they're not a, a cause and effect mm -hmm. relationship. And so um, as, as you think about that, I want you to be, as a facilitator, prepared to address the, those particular things. Because again, the, this obesity is one of those bias or discriminating mm -hmm. uh, features that people still think are accepted acceptable to, mm -hmm. to, to have, right? So you'll see it in movies mm -hmm. that the, the, the uh, it's usually a morbidly obese person mm -hmm. is, the, is the, the, the point of jokes, is the, um, is the comic relief. And, and I have to say, I, I appreciate the, that show, um, what is the, not 30 something, This Is Us. Mm. Have you seen that yes. show at all? This yes. Is Us. For, for probably Isn't the- Is that Katie too? I think she is yeah. Katie on that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so, so there is there is a woman who, uh, by many accounts, folks would say is morbidly obese. But I think it's the first time that I've seen on television they've actually shown um, her struggles with it. Her struggles with it, and that you know, she has a human yeah. aspect to it, right? right? So she's not a dysfunction walking right. around. Right. She's a she's a, a, a three or four dimensional human being. Right operating uh, w with these challenges and addressing a world right. that um, does not necessarily see her gifts but, or her talents before they see her physical presence. Right. I think it's important to remember, right, if you are concerned about health, it's a very different approach than the ridicule we're talking about. So you could be concerned about someone's health and have a conversation, a respectful conversation around it, um, and challenge your biases, right? Because how someone appears physically has nothing to do with how you should treat them as a person. And so that's a big part of this activity is to try to realize that irrespective of how someone looks, you can still, you still have to treat them respectfully. Yeah, and, and we're giving you this as facilitators so that you can gear yourself up for this piece of the conversation because this is this might be one of those places where people's uh, biases, their, their prejudice, mm -hmm. um, and their unconscious bias manifests. Mm -hmm. And so you need to be able to address those mm -hmm. in, a, in a caring um, and competent way. Right? And so this next activity is designed to kind of engender some of that. Right. So um, the, the, this activity is simply count the number of triangles. 
and then you give them 30 seconds and ask them how many triangles did you get. Invariably, you'd get like 9, 10, 13, 15. Um, and once you get someone with the high count, you know, congratulate them, have everyone uh, in a round of applause, um, and then ask them to define a triangle. So what, what is a triangle? Typically, it's defined as something with three sides and three corners, and people will come up with these answers. And then ask them to look at that and say, ask them to identify how many of those triangles have three sides and three corners. And then they realize, oh yeah, zero. You have three Pac-Man, but you don't have uh, <laughs> three triangles. Um, and so we talk about how did that happen? Uh, how did you identify or count 15 triangles when they don't have the complete information? And that's where we fill in the gaps. We come up with our biases and picture triangles the way we see them. And it's also why some people will count three triangles and some people will count 15 is because that's how you are filling your gaps. And that's simple gestalt psychology, right? That if we don't have an answer, our brain is not it is not wired to go without an answer, so it will create an answer. Even if it's the wrong answer, the brain says, well, at least I have an answer. And so, um, so we have to recognize that. And so when we talk about Katie's case in particular, we have to be mindful that sometimes we can make correlations that don't exist, that we can draw conclusions that aren't actually conclusions that make sense either for the context, mm -hmm. for the time that we're in, or for the situation that we're involved in. And so it's important for us when we're thinking about hiring decisions, when we're thinking about promotions, when we're thinking about who, who needs to receive disciplinary action, mm -hmm. right? Is it possible that I could be making correlations with things that actually aren't corollary at all? Could I be making connections that, that aren't there? And so that, that's why it's important to have policies and procedures, to, to have written documents that, that allow you to guide your processes in a systemic way so that you eliminate some of that unconscious bias and really allow people to develop uh, an opportunity to be their best selves. And the whole fact that it's an unconscious bias is that you're not doing it. Again, you're not... We're not blaming anyone here, you're not at fault, but it is your responsibility here to say, I may come in with this information and I may fill in the gaps, but what can I do to challenge myself so that I don't do that? Yeah, and a lot of times when we get to this part, we talk about this fault versus responsibility mm -hmm. and that um, we talk about blind spots, that mm -hmm. our, our cars have blind spots and they're typically in pretty obvious places, right? So the, the sides or the back or underneath mm -hmm. the car. And I, I oftentimes joke that if you drive a Hummer, the whole thing is a blind spot, right? But it is not my fault fault that I have blind spots. However, it is my responsibility. Right. And what are the two ways that we typically kind of find out about our blind spots? Um, building awareness, right? So exposing yourself to things that you're not familiar with. So you could do it watching a show, um, a documentary. I'm not saying, you know, the, the culture comedy shows, but a documentary or, what, or reading books about people's experiences from cultures different from yours. Um, listening to audiobooks, having conversations with colleagues different from you. Because typically when we talk about having a more inclusive environment, people automatically go to, let's do an ethnic buffet or a potluck, right? And that's really, really superficial, but it's a good start, uh, provided that's a good conversation started to going into what your childhood was growing up, what you know foods you grew up with, um, and then trying to make sure that you are listening to the other person and again, recognizing commonalities and differences that make you who you are. Yeah, so you can do that. You can look for those blind spots. You can you know, go out and do all those things that Amrita was just talking about, or you can have an accident, right? So you say something that's that's inappropriate, you do something that's inappropriate, and people give you feedback about that, you suffer the consequences of that, mm -hmm. and you learn from it by failing fast, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, or you can be proactive and really right. seek out the, the, the knowledge necessary to 
uncover those blind spots for yourself. And what we hope comes out of this whole training too is to get everyone in our teams comfortable with these conversations. So for instance, if I say something unconsciously, which is a biased comment, that my colleague feels comfortable to address it with me and say, hey, you said this, this is how I perceived it. Was that what you intended? Mm -hmm. And we hope that these are the conversations we take back to our workplace so that we are keeping each other accountable um, to be respectful colleagues. Yep. And as a takeaway, we, um, we encourage you to have conversations around this, this card. Mm -hmm. And um, so there are, uh, there are six activities on this card. But we typically... Uh, deal with about three of them on mm -hmm. the card and the rest you have to come back to us for some uh, some other guidance all right um, but in letter a we, we typically ask people to look at look for um, what they see so first of all and typically what people say is that they see a bird with something in its mouth um, sometimes it's a baby sometimes it's a, it's a sheep um, and then we ask them to the, the, change the perspective right turn the card around see what else they can see and if you flip the card uh, 180, you see an island with something that looks like trees and some water and a fish, um, which is a completely different image from what A showed us initially. Yeah. And so then the, the, the question, the reflection question is, is it possible that uh, your colleagues, people outside of your uh, your frame of reference, outside of your paradigm, your context, could be seeing a world um, that is totally different from, from yours? And hopefully the answer is yes, that that is at least a possibility. And then uh, we move over to letter B. Letter B simply is, um, you know, we, we ask people, what is it that you see? And many folks say that they see a face mm -hmm. and other folks see the word liar. And, um, and when they encounter this card, mm -hmm. the, the lesson is what you lock on to is what you see. Mm -hmm. So if I lock on to positive things in my life, I see positive things. If I lock on to negative things, I see negative things. But simultaneously, as I lock on to some things, I'm locking out other things. Mm -hmm. And so if, uh, if I'm in a homogeneous group, I will always see my, my, my group or what my group does will always seem normal. And I'll lock on to that, but I'll lock on the other possibilities that other groups could have the same or similar uh, issues, concerns, or motivations. I have to quickly put a plug in here. Uh, if you feel that you need to expose yourself to people different from you and so you're not in homogeneous groups, a great way to do that is the Mayo Employee Resource Groups, the merges. So if if you yourself are not on the merge, I would encourage you to do that as facilitators for these conversations. You need, you know, I would recommend that you expose yourself to as much a positivity um, around these different groups or as much conversation, not just positivity, but a conversation around these groups so that when you walk into these situations, you are more aware of your own biases or where you um, can answer questions and address uh, situations. Yeah, merges are great, yeah. great resources for this. And and we would encourage you to, as a facilitator, to, to join a merge, but also make a plug for the merges at this right. part in the, in, in the program, mm -hmm. right? Um, letter C, we've already we've already covered. And how do you do number three? How do, how do you address so, number three? In, in fact, on the card, you'd see some uh, words right there, uh, which will help you address it. So typically, you'd say, okay, can you see a finger? Um, can you see a hat? And then... Um, I think I there's think also there's an arrow, arrow, too. Arrow, yeah. And a house. And so people will typically mark that out. And then what else can you see, right? So... You're seeing things that are blacked out, that are present, but what is in those spaces that you may be missing? So if you look at, just take a pen and then mark a vertical line on either side of those black um, objects, you'll read the, letter, the word fly. Um, and so people don't often see that is because you're seeing only what is very evident and you're not seeing the, the message between the lines. Yeah, and we're also directed to, to see those shapes, right? So mm -hmm. just by people mentioning those shapes in the, in the space and in the room, I'm now looking for more shapes mm -hmm. um, where if I was free to, without any other confines, if the, the context wasn't 
the way that it was, if we hadn't had a certain kind of paradigm around this diversity conversation, if we you know, weren't at work, I might see things a whole lot differently, but that limits my ability to, to see what can actually provide me real information, which is the word fly. And so with these sets of activities, we hope that you're able to engage um, our colleagues in expanding the, the learning from the stereotype threat and the unconscious bias online trainings so that we may have a, a more dynamic experience in this learning session, but actually that we extend that learning to every aspect of our working life. And lastly, too, we go, we give you another handout to give uh, folks, and I don't know if it's on here, but we'll make sure you get a copy of it, uh, which is your takeaways. Um, oh, here it is. And so your takeaways around eight things to remember, what you can do, like we talked about, what you can do to make sure um, that you are challenging your biases and learning more about the world around you. Um, and so these are some things that they get as a pocket card that they can take back with them. Yeah. So if you have any further questions or comments, um, both of us are available mm -hmm. to do consults. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel that this is something that, um, you know, other groups can uh, benefit from, please share this link, share this, mm -hmm. this, this training session. Um, because we want to make sure that we provide an opportunity for all of our employees mm -hmm. to get access to recognizing how they can diminish their unconscious bias so that we can all have uh, equal and fair opportunities. And just as a reminder to what is in it for you as a facilitator, um, I think having these conversations, not just in the passive way, but having it where you are up there talking about these conversations makes you a little more comfortable with this. I know I've had great learning with the sessions that I've taught uh, with, uh, facilitated with the people um, in the groups. And so this is a great learning for you and a growth opportunity for you as well as your colleagues that you're working with. Yeah. And you don't have to have all the answers. Your job is to create the space where, um, people can discover these things mm -hmm. about each other and about themselves mm -hmm. uh, in, in a, in a, safe, in a sp safe space and environment. So, yeah, you, so don't feel like you have to... And here's the other thing. And this, is the, this is the kicker. You have a style of training, mm -hmm. and I have a style of training, mm -hmm. and they don't have to be the same right. style of training, right? right? So... We, you don't have to do things like we do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you know, you, you may be way more funny than, than we are, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure, you know, you're probably at least more attractive than I am. But, but you, you don't have to, we're not trying to make many, many me's. We, we really want you to, to look at these activities as things that you can do mm -hmm. um, yourself because there's there's no magic to this there's no mystery that it, it really is about skill building and development mm -hmm. here's another thing that that I'd like to give you is that if there are any pieces of this that you think would be valuable for your teams mm -hmm. or your train take little pieces of this and 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 practice with with your your teams or work groups or other people's teams and, and, and work groups uh, because that's how you build the muscles mm -hmm. to be an effective facilitator. Yeah, a great place to do this is when you have your team meetings, ask for five minutes on the agenda at the beginning of every meeting and talk about unconscious biases, uh, service excellence, teamwork, and all of these conversations. And you'll find there's a common thread that connects all of these different aspects of any human interaction. Human interaction. I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> My name is Andre Cohen. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, hopefully, it gave you some skills that you can use. I'm Amrita Prakashna. Thank you again. Peace out. We <laughs> out, people. <laughs> yeah.